Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 8 of the Let's Learn Awake guitar series. Today we will be focusing on the big lie, or at least Dream Theater's version of the concept. Now it's abundantly clear that Kevin Moore is hiding his true feelings from the band. And no Mike Portnoy, this song is not about Kevin Moore wanting to leave the band. I fear it has a far darker connotation to it that could potentially put my channel at risk if I go too deep into the conspiracy. Now I know, I know, I know, I know. I can't just leave you all hanging like that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to meet you in the middle. I'm going to give you a few hints as to what this whole thing is about so you can put the pieces together for yourselves. Now there are three main characters to this narrative. You ready? Kevin Moore, some girl, and her stepdad. The song Lie can be seen as the spiritual successor to the previous track, which was The Mirror. Now, these two have something in common. We need our seven-string guitar for both of them. So Lie uses a seven-string. Now, the one thing that's a lot less satisfying is that this is the eighth song on the album, and we're using seven strings. I was expecting to use eight strings, but I guess, eh, screw me, right? Here's main riff number one played on the guitar. As you can tell, the first riff of this song opens up with a nasty seven string guitar riff, all on that low B string, with a nice bluesy flair to it. We're hitting a B with that syncopated rhythm. Da -da 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 -da. You can see this as a slow 16th note vibe. D, E, E, F, E, D, and back down. So it's all blues at that point with the minor third, the perfect fourth, and the flatted fifth, which is the blue note, by the way. Coming in after that, we have this other heavy guitar riff that just plays around on the second and the third fret of the low B string. Check it out. So all we're doing is playing around with the first three scale degrees of the B minor scale. So it's B, C sharp with a little pull off, and then and a nice third fret artificial harmonic to get us through that. So let me play that again. Woo! It's like we're in an episode of Metalocalypse. Let's move on. Moving on from that, Kevin Moore has his first entrance on the keyboard, so let's take a listen first, and then we'll talk about it shortly afterward. This sounds like a long, drawn-out train sequence, as if the train you're waiting for is arriving way too late. Six o'clock on a Christmas morning is when it's supposed to be here. It's getting here at 12 noon. You're never going to make it to your relative's house in time. Not going to happen. And Kevin Moore is certainly not going to help you out at all. But that's kind of cool that he decides to just play sound effects on his keyboard. I guess he really was getting extremely bored with the band. On a serious note, however, this is a pretty cool production trick where Kevin Moore's keyboard is being used to create atmosphere, a crescendo of something that sounds like a train horn, and it also supplements the music video very well too as uh, it's in New York City. A lot of trains in New York City. So yeah, it's just to create a vibe and to get the song into the first verse. With verse one, we are greeted with a more syncopated version of the first riff of the song. Check it out. So if we look at that, it uses all the same notes as the intro with a tiny little riff at the end. We're syncopating this first part with some mutes in between. And you're going to slide into the fifth and sixth back to the fifth again. So that's really the only difference in articulation. Keeping that pick moving in a sixteenth note motion as well. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Repeating 
it, and then watch. You hit that blues riff at the end, outlining the flat seventh of the B chord. Sounds super bluesy, right? Now on the second ending, we just open it up a little more. So we're nice and tight and syncopated and rhythmic, and we remain rhythmic, however, we're opening up the palm mutes at the end. Check it out. Last time. Hear how I played all open Bs there with no palm mutes? That helps us get back into the riff, and eventually into the chorus part as well. Now remember that train sound from the beginning? Kevin Moore resolves into the verse playing a, a series of power chords. He's almost playing like a guitar player on this one. And he's just using a B5, a D5 on top of each other, which creates a B minor 7 and a major 3rd to keep that train sound going. For some reason, major 3rds always reminded me of trains. I don't know why. There's something wrong with me. Now the reintro comes in exactly the same with this riff. So, nothing crazy there. But Kevin Moore comes in with something that sounds like a giant elephant, or multiple giant elephants just screaming B's and A's and F sharps at you. See, I can't even make that sound if I tried, right? Try making that sound with your mouth. Guarantee you're going to have some problems. So did you hear the difference? Check out the ending. We use the same two chords. Tritone instead of the major third. Now the tritone makes it sound more like a, a demented horse than a train at this point. So just remember that. It's also super bluesy. Kevin Moore is a master of the blues. Don't let John Petrucci fool you with his seven string riffs. Kevin Moore is a bluesier man. So after we finish up with those two verses and the reintro section, the guitar comes in with main riff number one, but this time playing the chorus. So let's listen to that chorus riff all the way through and I'll break it down as we go along. So we're basically cycling between the main riff from the beginning in B, coming to a similar riff in E, coming back to B with a higher octave, and then hitting the main riff again. So check it out. So we have the main riff in B, all the same chords. We play it four times. And then playing around with the flat 7 and the 1 of E and also going to the flat 2 so it's a Phrygian progression at this point. It's using the blue note of the B blues scale and putting it on top of an E chord so kind of a cool application in that respect. There's also something very interesting going on with the keyboards on top of this part. Um, it mirrors the vocal part. Okay so listen carefully to the melodic content of this. It's not just melodic it's also ambient. Check it out. The first thing I'll notice how spooky that sounds. Oh my goodness. Gives me chills, like almost like a Nine Inch Nails song or something like that. I think that's really the direction Kevin Moore is trying to go to, and uh, the other band members just weren't having it. But yeah, just very spooky sounding, and it supplements the vocal so well because it's just doing the exact same thing, just in a slightly different manner. It's almost like there's a ghost hiding in the background. Now James Labrie is also singing that F sharp up top, and what's interesting about this F sharp is that it's a major 9 on top of the E. Well, hold on a sec. The riff has an F on the bottom, which is a flat 9. So we have a flat 9 and a major 9 going at the same time. And that sounds like this. When you play it together, it sounds kind of bad, doesn't it? it sounds stupid. But the way that they do it is genius because it ping-pongs off of the riff on the bottom. Remember from 6 o'clock we had two different moods happening in the different parts. 
the guitar was playing a minor progression, the keyboards are playing a major progression, a sort of similar thing is happening here, but a little more cloaked in disguise. Coming off that point of interest, we come back into the main riff in B, but up the octave this time. It sounds like this. All that's happening here is we are sliding from the A to the B power chord, 5 to 7 on the E string, and just doing that, giving it a little, little Judas Priest. Then we come up top with even more Judas Priest riffs, like this. All fourths. Now I classify perfect fourths as being very Judas Priest-like, and I'm going to say it again. It's like Judas Priest, okay? Now we're just going up to the 7th fret of the D and the G string, and going up to the 9th. And then sliding up to the 10th, so perfectly in the blues progression, right? And it's the same riff, too. You're just playing it with high, perfect fourths. And we go right back into the E riff. With everything else being the same. And then right back into the main riff once again. All right, so let's hop into another verse riff. This time we're on verse three, which is a unique verse, and even has a couple time changes in there as well. So check this out. The most notable part about verse three's riff is its rhythm, and it goes like this. One again, eat a three, a four again, one again. Just like that. And right at the end of that second time, going to the fifth to the third fret, we add another beat at the end of that measure. So we're actually turning it into a measure of 9 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. A pretty cool use of alternating time changes there to keep a little more interest in the part so we're not repeating ourselves because there's a lot of B going on. If you haven't noticed, there's only been really two chord changes in the entire song, B to E, and that's pretty much it. So that's the function. We're just on the one here. Uh, but it does go to a C sharp after that measure of nine. And that's just to break up the monotony a little bit. Now Kevin Moore, as per usual, is supplementing the guitar part with something even more bluesy than the guitar. Now check this out. See what you think. So there's definitely a really cool distorted organ sound here and um, more bluesy progression. So we're hitting just this B5 and a bluesy progression coming out of it with the tritone, fourth, and the flat and third. All sort of outlining this B minor 7 type of feeling with the flatted fifth. Now at the very end when it hits that bend, it's actually playing around with the third of the C sharp chord. So the guitar is playing the C sharp on the bottom with the power chord, and then Kevin Moore is coming in with a third, and then bending it up to a major third, which we're allowed to do in a blues sequence. You can mix the major and minor chords of that chord. This is utilizing the sharp nine and the major third perfectly acceptable in American blues music. Chorus 2 is exactly the same as Chorus 1. When we come out of Chorus 2, however, we hit riff number 2, which is this one, with Kevin Moore's elephant noises on top, so check that out. And then as soon as we're done playing that four times, we hit this open D power chord like this. And we just let it kind of ride out, let it fade out. And we are now in our new key center, which is D minor. Okay, and this is where the bridge section starts. And it goes like this.
So our new key center for this riff is D minor, and that's signified throughout the vocals. Um, it presents itself as if it's in G minor or G7, but really we're dealing with notes within the D minor pentatonic scale going like this. D, F, G, C, D, F, G, F, D, F, G, C. So it's only till the very end where we actually see that it's a G7, but it's not really a G7 because the vocals indicate that it's in D minor. That's D minor blues right there, okay? So that's all figured out. When James Labrie goes up a little bit higher, I'm not gonna ask her today, it turns into a Dorian mode over the same exact progression. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So it's, you know, D minor pentatonic followed by D Dorian. And then we stay in the D minor progression, but this time this is more exemplary of a D minor progression. So we're going like this. We're actually starting on A this time. A, C, D, G. A, C, G. Right? Repeating. Now that ending section is straight up D minor pentatonic. It's as if it wants to resolve right back into a D. So this time it presents itself as a D minor while starting on the note A. So this is our second in three different progressions that are going to be occurring here, or three different patterns, I should say. The third one is a completely different case, and this is when James Lavrie's vocal goes up way high into the stratosphere. It's, uh, we're actually in F sharp minor now, and we're starting on the note F sharp, going like this. This is presenting itself as a B minor 7, but the melody is in F sharp minor. So we're starting in on D minor pentatonic, going to a D Dorian, and then coming into a D blues with the tritone outlined. And that's all D minor blues, no doubt about it. And then the last part, I want to talk about lifelong mistakes. You can tell your stepfather I said so. Kevin Moore picked the most abrupt change in the song to an F-sharp minor pentatonic from D minor pentatonic. That's an odd motion because that is a, uh, that's a full major third away. I'm not sure what it was thinking there, but I think you might have been thinking about the stepfather, if you know what I mean. Really gross, disgusting stuff here. Let's move on to the nasty riff, which I think is more exemplary of uh, the theme of this song. Nasty. So as you can see, this is basically the motorcycle from hell. This is a motorcycle riff from hell. John Petrucci's got his sunglasses on, he's got his uh, Harley Davidson revving up in the background, shooting exhaust into Kevin Moore's face behind him because he's a dorky keyboard player. And he's going like this, B, D, whoa! Did you see that bend? You don't want to skip out on that bend. You want to actually slide up from that D power chord into the bend like this. And then slide back down. That's how you get that massive up and down motion happening. As if you're riding the, you know, some kind of bungee cord that's just pulling you up and down and stretching your reality beyond comprehension. The next part goes in like this. B, E, F. So that's a fourth to the flat fifth blue note. Very nasty. Then we go like this, back to the first two. We do the same thing, except we're only going up to the eighth fret this time. So we're bending up from the flat six to the flat seven, creating that flat seven dominant tension on top. So listen. Whoa. Very crazy. And then as soon as we come out of that, you don't want to come down too far because we have to get right into a F sharp power chord to an F. So that's five to flat five, a lot of tension. And then we add an extra beat at the end for a measure of seven, eight, going like this. That's D, C sharp going to B, flat three, two to one. Now after that, we head into the pre-solo section. Now, the pre-solo section is the same as the first part of the solo itself, all right? So we're gonna be repeating this. Um, but it's a series of open B power chords acting as pedal points below Kevin Moore's changing keyboard part. And basically what we're outlining is a B5 to a flat seven, 
a major six for the Dorian mode to the flat six, flat seven. All right, and it's all going under like this. One e n e a three forty. One e n e a three a e n a e n e a three forty. One e n e a three a e n a. So keep that exact rhythm in mind when you're playing through this. It's a very slow four count. Da 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 da. Now listen to Kevin Moore's keyboard part on top of that. It follows the exact same rhythm, but it's playing a chord progression. Like I said, that B Dorian to the flat six, flat seven. Check it out. And all the while, let's not forget that Mike Portnoy's drum fills are a very important compositional angle to this. Okay, he's adding a lot of interest to this section. He's basically the soloist, you know, just going along with the rhythm on the bottom. So, kudos to him for doing that. So before we can start getting into the guitar solo, we have to talk about the rhythm guitar first because it is completely unique but does use elements from previously within the song. So here's the very first part. It's the exact same as before. So that happens underneath the first legato section of the solo. Then the second half is a palm muted chord progression that occurs and progresses into the rest of the solo. So check this out. So we're playing around with different notes of the scale being accented at the end of the phrase. So we're starting off with a B, just like everything else in this song. To G, which is the flat six, we continue on. And then we hit this riff. That's almost like a B minor pentatonic or a D major pentatonic run. I'm going to say B minor pentatonic since everything's so B heavy in this damn song. Right after that, we open up the chord progression with something that sounds like this. So here we're actually changing the chords far more frequently, and we're starting off with the same exact riff as before, B to D, and then we have this moving line. So that's just going between B, D, E, D, with a little pull off there, and then a power chord on that D coming off the open B. That's actually a B minor arpeggio, or B minor 7 arpeggio. Do that twice, and then head right into an E chord. Now here's where an E major hits. Right into G, A, leading right back into B. That's flat 6 to flat 7 to 1. A pretty typical chord progression given the circumstance. Now let's hear the guitar solo on top of all three of those rhythmic sections. Check it out and enjoy, and I'll meet you on the other side. Section one starts off with this legato run, a legato run that starts on the second fret of the low B string and ends all the way up at the 14th fret of the high E string. So we're covering a lot of ground here. Now legato simply means that we are playing a slurry of notes. We are slurring the notes that we are using um, and mostly with hammer-ons and pull-offs. So instead of playing the notes like this, with the right hand, all the notes being picked, we're going to do this. We pick one time and use our left hand finger strength to carry us throughout the lick. We're starting off with eight times on this 2-3-5 pattern on the low B string using a B Dorian mode. 
you want to play that eight times. And then what you're going to do is you're going to move up to the third fret and play three, five, seven once. And that picks us up into the rest of it where everything remains relatively the same in three different octaves. So beyond that we play four, five, seven on the E string, four, five, seven on the D string, hammer-ons and pull-offs all the way, and then sliding up to five, seven, nine. So we're doing the same shape just up an octave, right? And then doing the same thing up another octave. That's at the 6th fret, 7th fret, 9th fret, and then just do the same thing. And then we do it up another octave at the 9th, 10th, and 12th fret. Just like that. Right after that, we get into a series of taps and pull-offs, okay? So we need to finger tap the 16th fret of the high E string. So we do those pull-offs, 16, 14, 12, 10, and then 17, 14, 12, 10. And you're going to double tap and then come back down to the 16th fret. So 16, 17, 16. Pretty easy. Now this next part sounds a lot more difficult than it actually is as well. You're actually using your right hand to pick the strings and you're tapping in between this moving scale line, okay? So basically you're going 10, 14, 12, 10, 9, 12, 10, 9, 7, 10, 9, 7, and then down this Dorian scale, adding a blue note, and then hammering on and off. So with that said, we're tapping on the 16th fret for the first two, and then we immediately tap to the 14th fret for the last ones. Down to the B string. It's like I was saying before, this whole pattern is in the B Dorian mode, so it includes all the notes of the B minor scale with a G sharp in it. So let me play the first part of that entire solo in slow motion. One, two, For the next part of solo one, we get a little bit of a break, all right? So we don't have to do anything too technically difficult, but we do get to have some fun. We're going to do some double stop bends with the unison note on the G string being bent up a whole step and the static note being held on the B. So check this out. We're on the ninth of the G and the seventh of the B. Using both the whammy bar and your left hand to give it vibrato. So we have double vibrato going on. Go up a whole step, half step. Big vibrato, every time you wait, give it vibrato. Go up a whole step, wait, whole step, half step, and building whole step into the peak of that entire run. So you're basically just running up the B Dorian scale as we're moving, right? Still over that B the entire time. Now it's time to go for by far the most difficult section of the solo. Now if I've learned anything from the music video, in order to execute this properly and get the right technique, you need a pair of sunglasses and you need to stand on the roof of a moving vehicle. So if you could do that, the techniques are going to come a lot easier to you. So we're coming in with a bluesy riff with a twist. We're also using a lot of notes of the Dorian mode as well, so that's why it sounds so interesting and fancy, really. So here's the first segment. You got to bend at the 17th fret of the B string twice. Hit the unison note at the 14th fret of the high E string and then do a double pull off from 19 and 17. So, and then instead of going back to the original 17th fret, we're actually gonna touch the 18th fret. So we have a half step in there, that's the blues. That's the tritone. Then we come back into that tritone and pull off the 16th fret instead. So that's that Dorian mode, so. Then as soon as we do that, we have this almost triplet-like rhythm. It's a mixture between 30-second notes and triplets. Beats me as to what it actually is, but we're hitting a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven notes in that little phrase. And you gotta kinda flutter through it, just like that. So the whole lick. We continue on with another flurry of notes, and this time we're not stopping for quite some time, so let's, uh, let's go over this whole pattern. We start up at the 16th, we come up to the 17th, and then down to the 14th. Then chromatically from the 17th fret to the 16th here, back up, but this time don't do chromatic, right up the scale, and then down. 
want to get it just like that, all tremolo picking down the line. And that doesn't stop. We have to keep going like this. 13, 16, 14, 13, down to the 16th on the D string. And then back up chromatically from the 15th to the 14th fret. So we're adding even more blues here. And if you follow that pattern all the way, we get... Now this next part hoodwinked me, it flabbergasted me for the longest period of time. When I was a teenager learning how to play this stuff, I couldn't wrap my head around it at all. I was just playing a bunch of random notes at random speeds, just trying to blast through it because I felt like there were just too many notes for me to get through in that small window of time. But today, on this day, I'm going to show you how to actually do it. And I finally learned this the right way about a couple days ago. So here we go. We start off with this pattern. So we're going up an F sharp minor triad and we're going like this. Coming up to the 14th, scaling down, and then doing a chromatic run on the A string. All of those are 32nd notes. Followed by this little slide. That's the set of 32nd notes. And then next, it hits a 16th note triplet run with all of the rest of the notes. We're hammering into this note, going into the 14th fret of the G, 14th fret of the B, and then double hitting the 17th fret and sliding in. That's how you get that articulation. Just like that. Then we continue on by going 15th, slide down the 16th to the 14th, and then that is a quartal voicing. It's all fourths stacked on top of each other. An extremely jazzy way of dealing with this. In fact, we're on top of an E chord when that's happening, so you can see this as an E11 chord, because it has the flat seventh, the fourth, the root, and the fifth, all in one. Now let me play this whole lick for you, but this time, when you're listening and watching, check out where the seamless transition in the rhythm occurs. We have 30 second notes, 16 note triplets, and not stopping the entire time. Very awkward position to play it on the guitar, by the way. It's almost like he's playing like a synthesizer line that he wrote himself on the guitar. It's really strange. So if that wasn't crazy enough, we still have some more insanity to deal with. This part starts off with an insane jump all the way from the 14th fret of the G string way up to the 22nd fret. A full step bend, by the way. And it's a double bend at that. So basically what you're doing is this extreme sweep picking as if you're ignoring all the notes of this B minor arpeggio. You're going 14, 16, 15 on the B, 14 here, 17. So, and then sliding all the way up to the 22nd fret doing a full step bend and before you even have a chance to really release that you do a half step bend on the 21st fret. Pretty insane, right? And it's not over either. Right out of the gate we have to do this inhumanely fast run down a pretty familiar pattern. This is like an A sus 4 pattern which sounds like this. Alright, and you have to fit all of that within basically a span of two and a half beats, three beats or so. Let me just go over the notes of this fast slidey section. So we're starting all the way at the 22nd fret of the B string. So if you don't have a cutaway on your guitar, you're going to be having some problems here. But we're going 22, 21, slide, back to the 22nd fret. So we get that intervallic movement between the perfect fifth. Slide like this. Usually we come back up, but in this case we're going all the way down. So this is the 18th fret, we're coming down here, 19th of the D, 21st of the A string, slide down, pull off, and then going that perfect fifth motion again, sliding down, 17th fret, up to there, and then back to the root. So real slow. The trickiest part is fitting the rhythm into the right spot because a lot of these patterns have too many notes to fit nice and snug and evenly within this part, um, which is probably why this solo is so unique and baffled my brain for all of these years. Here it is full speed. Wow. 
So coming out of that guitar solo, we hit the chorus once again. Now the chorus section remains the same in terms of form, so it's still a B blues going to an E blues, uh, but this time we have a lick that kind of changes everything right in the middle, so check this out. <laughs> So instead of playing the high octave power chords going from A to B, we play single notes with a little pull off like this. Alright, so at the 7th and the 9th fret of the D string coming down to the A string, outlining a B minor pentatonic of course, and then we do this. That 7-7 seven, seven on the G and the B, that's that train sound that I've been talking about, even more stuff, so I think John Petrucci and Kevin Moore have been hanging out a little bit. They keep talking about trains, their Lionel collection. And here's that final part. It's just playing around with different notes of the B minor pentatonic scale, adding a little bluesiness and jazziness in there as well. So we're going up with this Chuck Berry bend. 9-7-7, seven, right? Outlining the notes of the B minor chord. Then doing a bend from the 10th up to the 7th and back down again. And then we go like this. All triplets on this last section here, and unstoppable triplets at that. So that's really outlining the 9th and the minor 3rd of the chord. And then we go to the 9th and 10th fret of the B string, which is a Dorian mode. Okay, so we're back to the Dorian mode. And then we sneak the blue note in there, 10th fret of the G. And then, coming down that extremely bluesy lick, and then ending like this with a Jimi Hendrix inspired lick to cap off the whole thing. Coming into the end of that final chorus, we hit the same riff as earlier, but double time. Right? Four noise going a little crazier. Then the last two times, go up the octave, just like we did before. And then we're greeted with this incredibly stupid transition riff, and that's exactly what I'm going to call it. An incredibly stupid transition riff. Remember that. Which then goes into the mirror, by the way. But here's what happens first. All 16th note spasms coming in and out of each other, alternating between those patterns. And all we're dealing with are three separate notes on each pattern the 5th and 6th fret of the B string, and the 6th and 7th fret of the B string. Now on the 5th and 6th fret we have the perfect 4th, the tritone, back down, and then to the root. On the 6th and 7th fret we have the tritone starting it, going to the perfect 5th, and then back down. So both of them playing around with the flatted 5th to create this uh, very disjointed, disjunct type of sound. Simply put, an incredibly stupid transition riff. And then it comes right back in to the song that this is a spiritual successor to. Lie in the Mirror I like to think of as uh, the same exact track but just split up into uh, two different songs here, right? But I feel like they're part of the same thing, right? Because why would they come back to the mirror if it wasn't meant to be uh, very similar in nature? So we come back in with this riff. Blah, 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 we remember all that jazz, just play a nice open B chunkster down at the bottom and keep it going until we get to the second guitar solo here. Now this second guitar solo is incredibly difficult to play, alright? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through the rhythm, alright? So we're going to do that now, and then you're going to see what comes up next, and let me tell you, it ain't pretty. We're probably going to die before the end of this video. The first section of Guitar Solo 2 harkens back to the mirror, the very ending of the mirror, or the bridge section we could say. And it goes like this with these chords, B minor, F sharp over, C sharp with the bass line moving up, D minor, to B minor, then we come down into this tritone, so remember I said this is like the bridge. C sharp minor, okay, C over E, and then F in root position. 
So even though this seems like it's going all over the place, we're already familiar with how this progression goes. We've heard it a million times in the last song, so it's just being reintroduced with a lead on top. So don't be scared of all these moving chord progressions, because we're going to connect the dots very logically. Trust me. The next part of the rhythm includes a bass riff and this crazy video game sounding organ part that I'm going to show you in just a second. But the bass part is kind of like this. It's on C sharp and then goes to D. So this is a C sharp Phrygian riff, which then immediately goes up to an E Phrygian riff. So minor third. goes back and forth four times total before it changes again. Now let's take a listen to Kevin Moore's organ part the first two times through and we're gonna see sort of a build-up as it happens. Right, this sounds like a final boss gauntlet from an NES RPG. Let's hear how he progresses with this and makes it even more intense the second two times around. This is really cool. So notice how the second two times around, he's adding another octave on the top to make it sound even more full, to make this stack tower up to the sky, just like the floating castle in Final Fantasy 1. The changes of the rhythm don't stop there. We hit a permutated hop cross buns, just like we do in every Dream Theater album, right at the very end. And it's such a peculiar place to put this, but hey, it sounds pretty cool when you put it all together. So once you're done playing the E Phrygian riff for the fourth time cycling through, we go like this. So a very odd riff. It's almost like a G hot cross buns. You're going from the fifth to the sixth to the root note, right? That's rock and roll, baby. And then we go like this. This is like the fifth scale degree, the fourth scale degree. And then, uh, hmm, this is very interesting, flat seven to five. Hmm, I wonder if this could possibly be a different chord, like a D7 or a D minor seven? I think so. We immediately hop back to the mirror rhythm, but it's on a C sharp this time. And we keep on going, just like this. And then, with that stupid transition riff that's no longer a transition, it's actually the ending of the song. It's pretty cool. It's also pretty stupid, but we'll let that go for now. So this is the moment everybody's been waiting for, the final solo to lie by Dream Theater. Now this is one of the most intense and extreme solos that exist, even for Dream Theater standards. I mean, John Petrucci really pulled out all the stops on this one. Now, the first part is a very melodic section over the mirror chord progression. So as we're moving, we're going to go bar by bar, and I'm going to tell you exactly what's happening on top of the chord. So we start off with this first lick. <laughs> 
and that's all there is. So the first lick is a minor third on top of a B, going to the second, back to the minor third, up to the perfect fifth, and then we land on our resolution, which is the next chord, which is F sharp over C sharp, the five chord. We then head to the fourth and fifth and root of that chord, which then resolves into a D minor, but the minor third of the D minor. Then we head into five, nine, minor third, right back into the B minor as if nothing ever happened. But that time when we hit the B minor, we are on a C sharp, okay, which is the ninth of the B minor. So a lot of minor thirds, ninths, perfect fifths. You see, if you land on a consonant note like this, or a jazzy enough note, all is well. And if you move with these little half steps and smaller intervals, you can make it work for yourself even better. We continue with the same riff on top of B minor. <laughs> And then a little resolution, quote unquote, into the F tritone. So we're going like this from the B to the C sharp, trilling in and out of it, and holding on that B, which is a tritone up from F, which is exactly what's happening in the chord progression. And then we continue it on with even more logical stuff. That whole resolution is an F tritone as well, just playing the notes separately. F, B, F. Which, by the way, kind of uh, diametrically separates what's happening here. The B and the F signify the two different key centers that are battling it out here, right? B for the B minor and F, which is the minor third of the D minor. So that's kind of a cool dichotomy that we're coming up with here. That immediately resolves into a C-sharp minor chord on the minor third. But the funny part is, is we're on an F before that, which can also be classified as an E-sharp, which is the major third of the chord. Just grace noting it to the minor third, but we're in C-sharp minor here. Um, then we bend up to the perfect fifth, and just do that. It's almost like a 3-2-1 in E major, right into a G, which is the C chord. Then we come up major 7, anticipating the F chord, that's the third of the F chord, and then we go F Lydian on the way up to our new key center, which is C-sharp Phrygian which goes like this. All of those notes play along with the C-sharp Phrygian mode, and all we're doing is we're sliding into the root note, sliding down to the fifth, and then going to four, five, flat six, but always resolving into the fifth, so that's our hinge. And then we go down to the root, to the flat seventh, which is totally allowed. We can see this as a C sharp seven chord, right? Just in a Phrygian mode. We then bend into the major third of the C sharp chord, which is an E sharp, bending up into an F sharp like this. That's a major third to sus four, going back and forth. The next lick goes like this, it's on top of an E. This is now an E Phrygian mode, okay? But actually, we're using more of a Phrygian dominant mode, which basically has the major third of the chord that we're on, right? E major, so E, G sharp, and B are all in there, but we have the flat six and the flat two as well. So it gives it that much needed tension to get through this. So we start with this little run. So that's just going up A, B, C, D, and then bending up into the root note down to the fifth. So nothing crazy going on there. And we're doing the exact same thing on top of E that we did with the C sharp chord. Four, five, flat six. And we end it with this crazy series of single string hammer-ons and pull-offs, right? But we're doing it like this. Two fingers at a time. We're going to use our pointer and ring finger for every single one of these. So we're going 12, 13, 12, down to 10, and coming down the E Phrygian dominant scale, which has a G sharp in it. So, all the way down to the open B string, which is, of course, the fifth. Everything hinges on the fifth here. Next up, we come back into C sharp Phrygian, but this time we treat it almost like a blues, but of course it's like a prog rock blues. Check it out. So 
So you see what I mean by a prog rock blues? Let's dissect it a little bit. So we have the uh, 12th fret of the B string being bent up twice, just like that, very dramatic. And then followed by a pick, a pull off, and then back to the bend again. Now the magic number is three because we're going back to that bend three times. See? We did it three times total. And then we do the same thing with this, where we're going from the minor third to the major third. So this is obviously blues inspired, but we have to be very accurate with our picking. So we're going 12, 13, 12, 9, and then 12, 9 on the B. All alternate picks, right? Like this. Then we finish off with this dominant 7, sus 4 pattern. We go flat 7, 5, sus 4, major third, all the way down, root flat 7, and then do that twice. And that finishes off the, uh, the pattern. So we give ourselves enough 16th notes to get through the entire measure, which then leads us back into the E Phrygium once again. Now this time we're going nuts. We're going absolutely ape shit. Ready? So that's just absolutely bananas, isn't it? So we're going all the way up to the 17th fret of the B string, which is the root note, and going between these half-step motions, right? Even if there's dissonance involved here and not necessarily the right notes, the whole idea is to create a chromatic sound for as much dissonance as possible. So we're going between the E and the F, which is a half step, right? Flat two. Then we go D to D sharp, which is also another half step coming from flat seven to major seven, but it doesn't matter. We're doing half steps. Chromaticism is the key here. Come down into the fifth. We go fifth and flat six. Okay, that works. That makes perfect sense. And then we go like this. Major third, perfect fourth, which is a sus four, also makes sense, just like we did with the C sharp chord. And here, E and F at the bottom. All in total. And then we have to do this bendy bend, tappy tap type of thing. We're gonna bend at the seventh fret of the G string, which brings us up to the root note, and then we're gonna tap three times on the 14th fret. Now that turns it into a B, so we're going from root to fifth. Just like that. Then you let it go as it's bent. So we hit the root note in between, and then we hit this one twice. Which basically would be the fourth. Okay, so that's an A on top of the E, and then we resolve into the D, which is the flat seven. So... Pretty cool sound. Now we have no time to waste here. We're going right back into C sharp Phrygian just like this with a series of flat nine diminished arpeggios. So check this out. So it starts off with a regular old C sharp major arpeggio starting on the major third. So we're going E sharp, G sharp, C sharp, E sharp, G sharp. So on the way down, you're going to sneak your middle finger in there for a nice FU to the C sharp chord for playing such dirty notes, setting up our diminished arpeggios, which go like this. Okay, so we start the first one at the 15th fret of the D string, and we move up minor thirds coming up this pattern. Just like that. You want to increase the speed as you go. And then we come down to the 20th fret of the D string, and we come up this pattern. Once again, all minor thirds compensating for the tuning of the strings. And then we add the last one, which starts at the 16th fret of the G. Once again, all minor thirds. But at the end there, if you notice, we had a series of pull-offs at the end, just going from the 19th to the 16th, 18th to the 16th. Once again, that's the flat seven in the major six, hot cross buns. Once you play it like that, you're never gonna unhear it. We finish off with this pattern. That's actually going down a C-sharp mixolydian mode, right? The major scale with a flat seventh, that's basically what it is. But we're ending on the flat seventh, so keeping the tension of the chord right there. So here's the whole thing slow. And full speed. All right, we're not out of the 
woods yet. We still have two full licks to go back and forth between these two chords. So check this out. We're going with uh, alternating between playing a really fast note on the high E string and then to the open E string, just like this. Ready? Check out this whole lick. So we start off with a series of pulling off a tremolo pick from the 17th fret of the high E string, which is an A, and then to a G sharp. So just like that, which is the fourth to the major third of the E chord. Once again, a Phrygian dominant mode. Coming into F, all the way down to C. So once again, we're playing in the A minor scale over an E, which gives us that Phrygian dominant mode. I'm not going to say it again. Then we do this. You're going to hammer and pull off this uh, nice little pattern here, this Mary Had a Little Lamb pattern, 8th fret, 10th fret, 12th fret, four times. And then you're going to slide down 7, 8, 10, and then you're going to come down even further, down the scale, and eventually land on the note B, which is the perfect fifth. Okay, so we're coming back to the perfect fifth almost always here. And as long as you get through those notes quickly enough, you'll hit that B right on that downbeat when you're supposed to, right? Coming out of that, we have a series of 16th notes that don't stop ever after this point, all right? And I'm serious about that. It's, we don't really get much of a break beyond this point, so you better be ready to keep picking. So we're back in C-sharp, and we're playing a proper C-sharp Phrygian scale here, but in this type of pattern, right? So we start off on the C-sharp Phrygian going like this, from the 9th to the 10th fret, which is that C-sharp to D, the 1 to the flat 2, and we come down this scale. We then go from G sharp to A, all right, which is the uh, basically the fifth and the flat sixth, so that makes sense too. Those are our two half steps in the Phrygian mode, by the way. Pretty intuitive if you ask me because of those two patterns moving downward twice. That makes things a lot easier to get through. Then we continue the pattern down, do the exact same thing down the scale. And then the last time we change it up a little bit. All on the downbeat for those steps moving upward, right? So we're doing a series of whole steps and half steps moving up the scale, but going to the open B string, okay, which would be the flat seven of the chord. All up the Phrygian mode. The next change is on the chord change, so this is E, and all of these are going between a series of major 7th, minor 7th, and diminished 7th within the scale of the E Phrygian mode, which is also C major, alright? And we're actually starting on C major 7 right here, going to D minor 7, C major 7, B half diminished 7, and then A minor 7, which is also C6. C major 7 again with a sus 4 in the major 3rd, and then from the perfect 5th you're doing another C major 7 arpeggio. So C major 7, D minor, C major, B diminished, A minor, boom, and all the way through that pattern we're ending on a B, which by the way is the 5th again. The perfect fifth is everywhere in the solo. And then during the uh, G major hot cross buns rhythm, on the bottom, we're doing this nonsensical chromatic scale, which isn't even really a chromatic scale, because we're skipping up whole steps in between. But the general idea is to use all four fingers, starting at the 10th fret of the D string, like this. Just like that. It's like a flight of the bumblebee, but less cool. And then we go like this. Just come up chromatics a half step at a time using the spider crawl coming downward. Very chaotic sounding, right? And the function of that is simply chromaticism, half step madness. Now this last part, I don't even know how to describe most of what's going on, so I'm just going to give you the, uh, the patterns. I'm just going to say it's a disjointed mess. John Petrucci is playing in three, while the rest of the band is back in four with the mirror riff, which is on a C-sharp root. 
this time instead of a B. I don't know why they're doing that, but um, it's Dream Theater, so they have to change it up every three measures at least. Um, and we're running down this pattern. Check it out. Very, 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 very peculiar. All right. Now, I don't really know how to describe it uh, technically, but I think this is just an angular way of approaching this situation. John Petrucci has his wah pedal on max this whole time, so even if he's making mistakes, you're not going to hear him. And uh, we're just going down a series of highly intervallic things. Like, we're starting on an F to an F sharp, which to me doesn't really make sense on top of a C sharp at all. It's just chromatics, that's all. You start off by doing the same two patterns on the E string, and then on the B string. All right, so you want to use the same articulation. And then we change it up a little bit. We're going full-blown chromaticism there. See, this right here is, is part of the reason why this makes no sense to me, because it's just going like this. C sharp, flat 2, which is D, C sharp, root, and then the major 7th. Any time you have a flat 2 and a major 7th in the same area, we have stopped caring about making sense, all right? We're just playing notes for the sake of playing notes at this point. It sounds cool, don't get me wrong, because it's meant to be atonal, and it's approached in a very musical way. So as long as you take these atonal melodies and don't take them too seriously, you're going to be left with something that sounds like this. Pure, utter insanity and chaos. Once again, nothing to say about that except more chromaticism. We come in with another pattern just like the rest. And then we cap off this entire solo with an elongated version of that same type of pattern. So now we're playing a measure of five. So two extra ones at the very end to complete the pattern. Check this out. Don't those notes sound awesome on the low B string? Guess what, guys? We are out of the woods. We are done with lie. And I'm so happy that you came along on this journey with me. If you would like to further support the channel, meaning you like what you see, go to www.subscribestar.com slash Romanova Music and you can become a patron, a monthly patron. You can also leave a tip on my PayPal tip jar. Any which way you want to support the channel is fine. The free options are just to like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. We got to combat this YouTube algorithm in any way that we possibly can because they don't like independent content creators like myself, who I believe provide very valuable information that I think you people want. So, with that said, thank you so much and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.